Okay, we are in um, Tech Math 3 pre calculus class, and today we're going to do 13 5 and 15 1 for our sections, which will be uh, very interesting. I can just imagine. So, uh, 13, 13 5 has to do with inverse trigonometric functions. Well, we've, we've been using uh, arc sine and arc cosine and arc tangent for a long time. And then, of course, there's also the arc cosecant and the arc secant and the arc cotangent, which we haven't been using for a long time. And our calculator doesn't even have a button that allows us to do that. So if we have to do one of those, that would be a different situation. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a calculator thing. Um, now, as we recall from seventh grade math, if something is a function, then uh, what, if I have one x, I have one y. So there's, at each point where I, I have an x, I only have one answer. So in order to have a function, we have to have a one-to-one -one relationship between the independent and the dependent variable. All right, so now I go and I take something like the arc sine function, and uh, I say uh, x is equal to the arc sine of y. So I'm, I'm going to do something like that. I say, well, um, when x is 0, what's y? Uh, well, it's going to be um, 0. And it's going to be um, pi. And it's going to be 2 pi. And it's going to be 3 pi. And it's going to be uh, minus pi. And it's going to be minus 2 pi. And, it's going to, and it goes on forever, right? Minus 3 pi. And then I, I draw that in. And, and so the arc sine function is doing that, doing this. And then I ask myself, well, I just said it's a function, but if I pick any particular number uh, of the x's, I get uh, an infinite number of y's. How can it be a function? So now I have a problem. I'm, I'm saying arc sine's a function, but I, I don't have it. So what I do, when we have things like that in math, we normally just cheat, right? So, yeah, cheat. So, so we're going to say that, that x is equal to the arc sine of y, but we're going to limit our, uh, our y. Can you, can you spell that one? So we're going <coughs> to limit our y. So we're going to limit our y so that we go from minus 90 to plus 90 degrees. And then that's the only part of the arc sine function that we use. So arc sine has an answer in the first quadrant. It has an answer in the fourth quadrant. But it's not something that's going to give us an answer in the second or third quadrant. And that way, I, um, I'm, I'm limiting myself. And now I am a function. I have one value of x for every value of y. And, and it's a one-to-one -one correspondence again. So I'm going to do the same. So I'm going to say x is equal to the arctangent of y, but y has to go from um, minus pi over 2 to uh, plus pi over 2. And I can do the same thing. I say, say y, x is equal to the arc cosine of y, but I'm going to limit myself, and I'm going to go from 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to pi. So when the arc cosine function, which Ramundo says it's perfectly OK to put on the same graph, so I'm going to do that. So the arc cosine function uh, does this. No, it doesn't. But anyway, it looks, it was OK until I went through there. Then it was pretty hosed. So. Well, let's get rid of it. All right, let's try it again. So it's going to go through 90, be way there, go through 0 here, go through 0 there. There you go. And that's going to do the opposite on this side. Ooh, go through there, go through there, like that. All right, something like that. Okay, so that's going to be the cosine guy, but I'm going to define it between zero and pi. So the only the only possible answers my calculator can give me is between zero and pi for the arc cosine. Arc cosine 
of y, but it's only defined between 0 and pi. I do the same thing for arctangent. Arctangent of y. <coughs> and I'm going to, uh, what, what do I define arctangent of y? Anybody know? Um, yeah, minus, minus pi over 2 to uh, pi over 2. And um, we can't have them both be greater than or equal to, can we? No, we can't. So neither of them can be. Because if I'm equal to um, pi 90 degrees on my tangent guy, then I'm infinite. I can't be infinite. Therefore, I have to have it, it only defined between uh, not inclusive of uh, not plus or minus 90 degrees. Okay, so that's how I'm going to do that. Um, drawing graphs of the of the arc functions. Um, so a graph of this guy would be okay to know. A graph of anybody else would be something that no one's going to ask you ever, so don't worry about it. But I'm going to use my my uh, calculator to find out what the arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent is. So I write it like this: arc, arc sine. Or I write it like this: arc sine. Now, notice that I'm that I'm not saying inverse sine. So that there's f of x, and then there's the inverse of f of x. I'm not saying that. So this is not saying 1 over sine. 1 over sine would be cosecant. Okay, so this is... What? Yes, there is an arc button on your calculator. So we'll... And, um, okay, I got my calculator out and I'm about to work a problem. Now look at number two. Oh, way to go. Number two. Y is equal to the arc secant of X. And we're supposed to write the equation using words. What? That's what it says. It says write the meaning of the equation. All right, so I'm going to write x is the angle, no y, y is the angle, y is the angle, y is the angle whose, whose secant is, y is the angle whose secant is x. There we go, yeah. Because see, the secant of y is equal to x, and x is equal to the arc secant <coughs> of y. So y is the is the angle. You didn't know you're in an English class, right? Whose secant is x. Oh, well, it wasn't that lovely. All right, well, we're going to quit doing that. Oh, you notice that we don't even do those problems. We start with 9. I forgot about that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have wasted your time with that guy. Um, so we're going to do number 9. No, we're not going to do 10 because you guys get to do number 9. All right, so number 10. Um, y is equal to 3 secant x and we want to find x all right so y over 3 is secant x and the arc secant if i could spell arc secant the arc secant of y over 3 is equal to x so now, now i know what y and now i know what x is no problem um, what? Well, y is equal to 3 secant x. x is equal to the arc secant of y over 3. Yeah. 
Um, hope I don't get a Y and have to solve it. Huh? What? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Moving down. Now, if you had Ramundo's calculator, you could actually solve it. If you had a number. Okay, number 18. Uh, y is equal to one-third the secant of 1 minus 4x. And we want to know what x is. All right, so we multiply both sides by y. 3y equals secant 1 minus 4x. Then we take the arc. How come we're doing arc secants all the time? That doesn't make any sense. So then we're going to take the arc secant of both sides. And we're going to see that the arc secant of uh, 3y is equal to 1 minus 4x. And then we're going to have that 4x is equal to 1 minus the arc secant of uh, 3y. And then we're going to have x is equal to 1 minus the arc secant of 3y divided by 4. And then we're done. I'm bringing the I'm bringing the minus four x to the other side of the equation, so that makes it positive. I'm keeping the one where it is. I'm taking the positive arc secant to the other side of the equation, making it negative. Oh, okay. Yeah. And why are we doing that? Well, why are we doing these problems at all? Is to repractice the skills we learned in chapter two, which we didn't cover in this class, right? So we're just doing ninth grade algebra again with secants and cosecants and arc secants. Yeah, that's all we're doing. All right, so now we're going to do two, 20. We're going to do 20. Number 20. <clears throat> the arc cosine of one half. Uh, 60 degrees, pi over 3, right? We want the angle whose cosine is a half. So we want the angle whose cosine is one half. And, and if we remember, from our 0 to 90 thing, the, the guy that uh, the cosine of 60 is a half. And that would, now, we don't have to do that. We just take our calculator. Um, our cosine of 0.5, um, and I'm in radians, naturally. So my calculator is whole city here. Let's see. I'm going to get it back there. OK, now we're good. Now we're in degrees. Arc cosine of 0.5. Oh, look at that. It's at 60 degrees. Wow. Couldn't believe it. Huh. Lucky guess, right? Sixty degrees. Arc cosine of a half. Your calculators do that? Especially on the front row? I worry about you guys, you know. Like late at night. <laughs> After, I'm, after I've been have been totally sleeping for four hours. Okay, the arc tangent. Arc tangent of 1 over the square root of 3. Well, I can just take my, well, we won't take our calculator. Um, okay, so 1 over the square root of 3 is really the square root of 3 over 3, right? And the square root of 3 over 3, we remember that that is 30 degrees, right? 30 degree, the, the tangent of 30 degrees is the square root of 3 over 3. So we're going to go with 30 degrees or pi over 6 for this guy. And then we're going to take our calculator and take the arc tangent of 1 divided by the square root of 3. And it's going to tell us it's 30 degrees and we were correct. So we don't necessarily have to remember that the, uh, the tangent of 30 degrees is square root of 3 over 3. But if we happen to remember that, then we could use it. OK, we'll drop down to 36. 
and uh, the arc sine of 0.75. Well, um, I happen to have it on really good authority that that's three quarters and three quarters the angle whose whose sine is three quarters is something that we don't have memorized, right? So that means I'm stuck. I have to put it in my calculator. Arc sine of 0 0.75 and uh, 48.59. So we'd probably call it 49 because I have two digits there and two over here. Okay. I'm going to do 40 next. Okay, so I got the tangent of the arc sine of 1 over the square root of 2. Okay, now we were, we were um, dealing with words later, right? So we're going to, uh, I want the tangent of the angle whose sine is the square root of 2 over 2. Okay, what angle is it whose sine is the square root of 2 over 2? Well, that's 45 degrees. What's the tangent of 45 degrees? 1. Okay. Good enough? So I, I, I put it in the words. I make that words turn into cents or dollars, and then I and then I find the answer. Okay, I'm gonna do 44 next. Number 44. We want the secant. The secant of the arc cosine of minus one half. All right, so we want the secant of the angle whose cosine is minus one half. If it were plus one half, then that would be 60 degrees, right? So the first quadrant answer would be 60 degrees. Minus a half is a second quadrant answer. And the second quadrant, that'd be 180 minus 60, 120. So this one, so we want the secant of 120 is what we're looking for. And we know that the secant is 1 over cosine, so we want 1 over the cosine of 120 and the cosine of 120 is minus a half so it would be over minus a half so this is going to be minus 2 the secant of the angle whose cosine is minus a half I guess we could have skipped a lot of steps there right if we would have real if I would have said dum de dum um, what do you think secant is? 1 over cosine. Of course, it's got to be 1 over a half. And step, skipped all the steps in the middle, right? So I could have done that. Um, right, skipping down to 52. Much, much more fun. 52. Uh, we want the tangent of the uh, arc cosine of x. All right, so um, doing what we've done, the tangent of the angle whose cosine is x. That's what we're looking for. Well, that looks like it's one equation, one unknown. It should be easy, right? All right, well, Let's look at a unit circle, a unit triangle for a unit circle. So radius 1, there's the angle. Okay. So if the cosine of x, if the cosine of theta is x, if that's the case, then what is the x component? That's x over 1, right? 
So x is here. Well, if this guy is x, what is the y side? Square root of 1 minus x squared, right? The Pythagorean theorem. So now I have a triangle, angle. I know the angle whose cosine is x. I got it right here. I got it written down. And I know the tangent of that angle, the tangent of the angle whose arc cosine is x. I know him to be the tangent of theta in my diagram, which is the y component, square root of 1 minus x squared over x, the x component. Okay. Nothing, notice I'm wearing short sleeves today, so there's nothing up my sleeves. I'm not hiding anything. You know. But I, if I don't draw that picture, guess what I'm going to do? Have the wrong answer. Right. So there's no way to get to the right answer without drawing a picture. And um, you have a high -speed uh, I don't think the high, did the high speed calculator get the right answer? Yeah. It did? Yes. Yeah, so uh, disturbs my karma considerably. Wasn't well, that good? That was good for the video, right? Yes. Yeah. Then I can keep the video now. Otherwise, I'd have to redo it next year. Number 56. The sine of the arc tangent of x. Alright, so I'm looking, I'm, I want the sine of the angle whose tangent is x. All right, so I'm going to draw a picture again. There's a unit circle, so that's going to be 1. Here's theta. And I'm going to take the tangent of theta, and that's going to be um, y over x, which is equal to x. Okay, so um, that means I can't have a unit circle anymore. So I'm going to get rid of this guy, and I'm going to say, well, that being the case, this side's x, that side's 1, right? Because if the tangent is x, then that's the y component over 1, and then the hypotenuse is 1 plus x squared, or you could call it 1 squared plus x squared if you'd like, either way. And then you say, well, what's the, what's the sine of that angle theta? And the sine of the angle theta would be the x component divided by the hypotenuse, 1 plus x squared. Okay, and um, we're going to 57. Well, that we we're only going to 57. I just did 56. So I guess I guess we're done with uh, this section of the book. Notice on page 473, there's a whole page of things to memorize, uh, which you don't have to memorize because it's in the back or front cover of your book, and you'll be able to use it. Okay, so now we're now we're in chapter 14. Uh, we have an imaginary operator i, which is square root of minus 1. We have a plus bi, which is rectangular form. We have r angle theta, which is rectangular, which is polar form. Um, if you want to take and square, if you want to, if you want to go and raise the imaginary number to some power n, and you're going to do that in polar form because that's going to be r to the n angle n r. If I could make an n, there we go, angle n r. And if I if I want the square root, I want the square root of four, um, four plus three i. Thank you. So I want the the square root of four plus three i. I would change that to rectangular form, five angle whatever theta is, um, to the one half, and then uh, that'd be the square root of five angle, whatever the theta is, divided by 2. What? Who? Where? I, I read the, the little letter on, on the 
So when I'm dealing n. Okay. So when I'm dealing with imaginary numbers, if I'm adding or subtracting, I want to be in rectangular form. If I'm multiplying or dividing or doing square roots or powers, I want to be in polar form. And as long as you keep that in mind, all of your days for doing handling imaginary numbers will be cool. All right, so now we're going to chapter. It's not even in the syllabus. How can I be going fast? Uh, okay, I'm slowing down. And uh, for those with TI-36 Pros, you put in the mode you want and put in the numbers the way you want them to put in, and it comes back in the mode that you want it to be in. So those are cool things. Okay, so number five, 15, chapter 15, we have uh, matrices. Now, why do we have matrices for? Well, because our computer science admin people like to keep data, right? So they, they like to know what currency you're in, dollars. And they, they like to know uh, your first name. And they like to know your last name. And they like to know your mother's, mother's maiden name. Okay, you like to know that. And they'd like to know the account balance. So now I, now I can go and make a matrix, and the, the first column is in what the currency is. Pounds, dollars, kronas, euros, um, first names. Um, Doug, Doug, Doug 1, Doug 2, Doug 3. Again. Last name, Smith, Corderville. Things like that. Mother's maiden name, Zosky, you know, things like that. Anybody, anybody can spell Zosky? Yeah, figures. Uh, starts with a Z, right? No, that's wrong. Anyway, count balance. So if you can't spell Zosky, it's obviously you're not your mother's mother's maiden name, right? Only those that actually have a mother mother's whose maiden name is Zosky. You know. And um, what? The That'll work. Yeah, it did. All right, well, so we're back on. So we're doing matrices, and, and the idea is that we have columns. Columns, that's not how, and we have rows. And we have elements. So we have A11, one, one. some element, first row, first column. We have A12, first row, A21, A21, second row, first column, A21, three one, third row, A N one. And then we got A21, A12, A12, first row, second column, first row, third column, first row, nth column. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be square. I don't have to have as many rows as I have columns. And then I fill all the elements up with things. So I have rows and columns. Um, is there anything to know? Okay. If I, if I have some matrices M, and I'm going to multiply it, and I'm going to add, I'm going to add and subtract it from N, then the dimension of the M guy and the dimension of the N guy has to be the same. So we use brackets, and we say that this is 3 by 3. Three rows, three columns. And these guys have to be 3 by 3. Three rows, three columns. If I'm going to add them. So I couldn't have something that was a, a 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to add that to a 1, 2, 3, 4. That, that doesn't work. It, position has meaning in matrices. So I, I can't, I, I'm going to have, they have to have the same dimensions if I'm going to be able to add them. Now, 
If I'm going to multiply the matrices, then that's a different thing. Then I have um, the row of the M guy by the column of the M guy as the dimensions for the M guy. And then I've got times, I'm going to multiply column rows, rows of the N by columns of the N. Now in that case what has to happen is that those two guys have to be the same, same number. So I could go, I could multiply two three by threes together, that'd be fine. I could, I could do a three by two times a two by five. I could do that. And when I do, the, the matrix that I end up with it would be a 3 by 5. So I end up with my answer would be a 3 by 5 matrix. But the, the number of columns of the first guy has to be the number of rows of the second guy. Otherwise, I can't do the multiplication at all. Okay. Too much theory, I know. We'll try problem number one, number two. Problem number two. What is the order of the matrix? Two, nine, five, two, six, minus one. I'm using brackets like that. What is the order? Uh, I got one, two, three rows, three by two. I have, I have three rows and two columns. This is a three by two matrix. And number six. 1, 2, minus 6, 4, minus 7, 3, 6, 4, 0, minus 9, minus 1, 0. What is the order of the matrix? So I've got three rows by four columns. So my order would be 3 by 4. Okay, we'll do number uh, 10. Number 10. X, 3, 4, 0, minus 6, 7 is equal to, or think about that as the same as, as much as it is equal to, 9, Y, 4, 0, minus 6, Z. All right, well, uh, what's X? What's y? And what's c? Seven. Okay, it's that easy. It just whatever position it is, it has to be that. In order for those things to be equal, the minus six has to equal the minus six. The zero has to equal the zero. The four has to be the four. The x and nine are the same. The 3 and the y are the same. The 7 and the z are the same. And uh, thank you very much, Hugo, for coming up with those answers. That's brilliant of you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we'll do, we'll do number, um, number 14 next. We're at um, 2x. x plus 2y x, y, z, s plus y plus z. All right, so I got three elements. One, two, three elements. And it's equal to 12, 22, 16. All right, well, I want to find x, y, z. So 2x is equal to 12, clearly implying that x is equal to 6. 6 plus 2y is equal to 22, meaning that y is going to be equal to 1. I put a 6 on the other side, that's 16, half of 16 is 8. And then I've got um, 6 plus 8 plus z is equal to 16, and that sort of implies z is equal to um, 2. Okay? 
I could I could do it that way. I could do it a different way. I I could go and say two x is equal to twelve, and then I could say um, x plus two y is equal to um, twenty-two, and I could say x y plus z is equal to 16. And then I can just take out my calculator and go um, second function system solver 3 by 3 system solver 3 by 3 enter. Okay, so I'm going to put in a 2 0 0 12. And then I'm going to put in a 1, 2, 0, 22. And then I'm going to put in a 1, 1, 1, 16. And then I'm going to hit the solve button. Solve. Oh, look at that. X is 6. I don't believe it. And Y is 8. And Z is 2. Wow. The calculator did it for me. So I don't necessarily have to um, stretch my brains a whole lot to get that answer. But that was a pretty simple thingy. And, but you do have a three by three equations, three unknown equation solver on your calculator. Unless, of course, you have the fancier ones and they go to multiple equations more than that. Okay. Now we're going to say, is it possible or is it not? So we said, if I'm going to add or subtract, I need the same order. Okay, so that's all I'm doing. I'm saying possible or not possible. All right, so um, number 12, number 17, yes, it's possible. Number 18, yes, it's possible. Number 19, yes. And number 20. Yes, so all the, every single one of those I can add. They're the same order. Perfectly okay. Uh, in exercise 21 to 36, use A, B, and C and perform the operation. Okay, well, maybe we can handle that. A is um, 1, 10, 6, 5, nothing yet, minus 2, 0. I'm just writing down what our variables are. B, 21 to 38. 0, minus 2, minus 8, 4, 7, 5. Now you could, you could put these in, the, in your calculator as matrices and have it do it for you if you'd like. 1, 4 minus 9, 3. Alright, so I want I want number 22. And I'm looking at minus C. So I take the C guy, and every place that's positive is now negative, and everything that's negative is now positive, and I am done. I look at the number 24 guy. And I want 2C. So every place that used to be a 1 is now is 2. And 2 times 4 is 8. And uh, 2 times minus 9. And 2 times 3. And all I did, every element got multiplied by 2. Okay, now I'm going to do 28. And I want A minus B. Okay, so element at a time, A minus B, 1, A minus B, 12, A minus B, 14, A minus B, 1, A minus B, minus 9, A minus B, minus 5. That's all there is. There ain't no more. Okay, we'll do it again. We'll do it with 32. All right, so I want 2A plus 3B. 
times 1 equals 3 times 0, 2. 2 times 10, 20. Two, 3 times minus 2, minus 6, 14. 2 times 6, 12, minus 24, minus 12. 2 times 5, 10, minus 12, minus 2. 2 times minus 2, minus 4, 21, minus, minus 4, minus 21, minus 25. 2 times 0, forget about it, 3 times 5, minus 15. Okay, at that point I ran out of room. I can't see the top problem to do the bottom problem, so I'm not going to do it. Um, hmm. We don't even multiply any things this time. That's no fun. Uh, I guess we're going to have to do 44. Looks like somebody sneezed in my book or something here. Must be chocolate. All right, number 44. A small company, a small manufacturing factory, keeps an inventory in matrix form uh, on the spreadsheet as follows. So I got twin, full, queen, and king. Matrix A is the inventory 1 June. Matrix B is the production for June. And matrix C is the sales for June. Find the matrix that shows the difference between sales and production for the month of June. Okay, between sales and production. So B, what, number 44? 44. So B is production, sales, the difference between sales, sales and production. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the sales and we're going to SCH sales, no sales, minus production. Okay, and then we're going to go make a matrix. So C minus B, 3. C minus B, minus 5. C minus B, minus 2. C minus B, minus 1. Okay, next row. C minus B, 5. C minus B, minus 1. C minus B, 2. C minus B. 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 So all we're doing is practicing our fourth grade addition skills. One element at a time. Okay, questions about that? Let's go back to our calculator. Go back to our calculator and um, we'll look at problem 28 again. So we'll look at problem number 28. And we have um, A minus B. And A is supposed to be um, 1, 10, 6, 5, minus 2, 0. And B is supposed to be uh, 0, minus 2, minus 8, 4, 7, 5. And we know the answer already. That's not the point. 
but we'll find the answer anyway. 1, 12, 14, 1, minus 9, minus 5. So that's what the answer is. So we take our calculator and um, matrix. So the math guy has second function matrix. And uh, we're going to edit A. We're going to edit A. We're going to tell it that it has two rows, two rows, and it has three columns. Okay. And then we're going to put them in. One, ten, six, five. Minus two zero. Okay, so we've done that. So now we have to get back. So second function matrix. We're going to drop down to B. We're going to go to edit B. Okay, B is going to be a two by 3. Okay, now I'm going to put in B. 0 minus 2 minus 8 4 7 5. Okay. Now we're going to go to matrix again. Now we're going to go to math. Yeah, I guess I guess math is the wrong place to be, so we'll get out of there. We'll get out of get out of there. So we're gonna quit. Okay, now we're gonna go A, second function, A minus second function B on our calculator. Syntax error, stupid machine anyway. I don't believe it. All right, so that's not what we're supposed to do. All right, so we're going to go to. Um, you second function matrix. Second function matrix. A. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there we go. A minus second function matrix down to D. Wow, there it is. Okay, so I got 1, 12, 14. 1 minus 9 minus 5. I don't even have to do my third grade math skills. I just have to enter it in my calculator to make it do what it bend it to my will. Now that's it. Now what happens is when we get on, there's going to be an inverse matrix. It's going to be hard to get, simple to get. Yes, yeah, simple to get. Okay, see you Friday. What? Every Friday.